Um, thank you everyone for joining this meeting. Uh, my name is Ioana. I'm from the Department of Chemical Engineering. And today I would like to speak to you about solar fuels. Why are we interested in this topic? And give you a few details about how our research is going on. So starting with solar fuels, um, well, I believe we're all aware of the climate urgency that we're facing currently and the net zero targets that we have set both as both worldwide and also UK. Uh, yeah. So we all know that in order to achieve climate targets, we need to increase the use of renewable energy sources to produce our electricity or potential fuels as well. So renewable, renewable energy sources are going to play an important role, increasingly important role over the years. And based on the IPCC report, actually solar energy is the one that has the highest potential contribution to the net zero emissions, especially uh, when we're talking about CO2 emissions reduction. And when we think about solar energy, probably most of you think about photovoltaics which is about converting solar energy to electricity straight away. But today I would like to hear about using and harvesting our solar energy to uh, form more sustainable fuels that we call solar fuels. How this happens, we can see that the whole process of solar fuels is very circular. We can start with the molecules such as CO2 or water, and by inputting energy to the sun and by using certain catalysts we can convert these chemicals into sustainable fuels or biological chemicals and then in return the fuel will be used to provide energy and will turn back to its original form of CO2 or water. So again very circular process but we're mostly interested in the initial part of the conversion. So starting, there are two most prominent re uh, reactions for this. There's the CO2 photoreduction, which, from which we can get uh, fuels such as methane, methanol, or CO, which is a valuable chemical. Or we can have water splitting into hydrogen, or hydrogen production, and oxygen. Now, one of the pathways towards this more sustainable conversion to fuels is photocatalysis. That's what we call the process. And more specifically, in our group, we're interested in the photocatalysis of CO2 to fuels and chemicals. And how this happens is we have this material, which is called photocatalyst, which, when irradiated, we have the form of, we have excited electrons that move from the valence to the conduction band, leaving excited poles in the valence band. We call this electron pole pairs or excitons or charge carriers. Now, once we have these excitons formed, we have in the conduction band the reduction takes place, where an acceptor molecule, in this case CO2, will absorb on the surface, activate, accept excited electrons, and it will be converted into products such as methane, methanol, CO. In parallel, oxidation takes place in the valence band, and we have a donor molecule, such as hydrogen, which can donate electrons to the excited phosphor and be transformed into products, in this case, water. Now, there are certain requirements for this reaction to take place. The amount of energy that we put, that we radiate the material with, can only be used if it's at least equal or larger than the bank of the material, where bank up is the difference between the conduction and the balance band. Of course, this bank up needs to be, let's say, narrow enough, narrow enough so that we can harvest a whole range of energy. And it also has to be wide enough so that we don't, so that we limit the combination of this electron and whole pairs. So in order for these excitons to take place in the reactions, we limit their combination and they need to effectively diffuse into the bulk of the material, transfer to the surface so that they can take place in the reaction. And 
if we're interested in performing specific reactions, reaction, such as seed reduction or hydrogen oxidation, the reduction potential needs to be, let's say, lower than the conduction band potential. And the oxidation potential it needs to be also lower than the valence band potential. Now, in this process, which we call photocatalysis, there is a number of factors that influence this, starting with the material, the photocatalyst, its morphology, the loading of the material, and also its porosity in surface area greatly affect the range of products and also the yield of products that we get. Of course, uh, it's a process that harvests light, so it's very important to control the light source and make it have uh, a difference between the incident light, which is the light that's actually irradiating the surface of the catalyst, versus the absorbed photons. So it's the absorbed photons that actually take part in the reaction. And of course, since it is a catalytic reaction, after all, conditions such as reactant concentration and rates, uh, experiment duration, pressure, and temperature can greatly affect the yield and the activity of this reaction. And of course, the type of reactor, if it's gas phase or liquid phase reaction, it can greatly affect the type of products we get. Now, in photocatalysis, we have this dual term issue. It's a process that involves light. Uh, so harvesting of light affects it, and it's a catalytic process at the same time. And because it is a complex process, there is a lack of consensus among all research groups on how to evaluate this performance of this reaction. A lot of people can uh, report product yield, so how much products have been formed, and this can be normalized by the mass of catalyst that we use, the reactor volume, or the duration of the experiment. Some people report selectivity of products, for example, how much methane is produced over all the other products. Uh, quantum efficiency is probably the most um, well, efficient way of reporting performance, as it takes into account not only the yield of the product formation, but also the absorbed photons that took part in the reaction. And finally, turnover frequency is a less used term. It's mostly used in the catalytic reactions, the heterogeneous or homogeneous catalytic reactions, and it takes into account the active sites of the material. So when we report and when we evaluate this performance of our, of our synthesis and our, uh, our process, we need to be very transparent and very honest about instrumentation, about how we did the process, and we need to report as much as possible of how many products did we form and what selectivity did we get. And there are many types of photocatalytic systems used specifically for CO2 photo reduction. This is the reduction, this is the reaction that I'm mostly interested in, that we're mostly interested in, in our group. Starting with semiconducting materials. These are the most widely used materials. Semiconductors are somewhere be, be, between insulators, which have very wide band gap. There is almost no electron transfer from values to the conduction band, with very low conductivities. And between conductors, which are the exact opposite, there is no apparent band gap, there is a continuous electron transfer, um, and therefore a very high conductivity. We're interested in semiconductors because we can tune this band gap. So by tuning the band gap, we can tune up to electron properties, and we can tune how much energy can we actually harvest from the irradiated energy. Most Commonly used semiconductors are oxides, as you can see, titanium oxide, uh, zinc oxide, some sulfides. A lot of people have used uh, common dots of materials or perovskites. This is the latest trend. And also nitrites. And I will come back to this later. Another type of system can be biological, mainly includes algae. And we have relatively high activities for this process. However, we need to have a lot of uh, resources and energy input. And also it's 
harder to, let's say, cultivate this material. So there is an increased cost when we're talking about biological systems. We can have biohybrids, where commonly a semiconductor material is used in conjunction with an enzyme or a protein. Of course, this has a certain difficulty in the synthesis, although it can still report quite high activities for this process. And finally, we can have metal organic systems. Uh, in this case, I present the radium complex, but we can also use MOPs, metal organic frameworks for this. Of course, metals, well, they can introduce high activity to this reaction. However, we need to be careful about which metals we use due to the readily, av readily availability or the expense of these metals. In our group, we're mostly interested in using semiconducting materials for this process. And even more specifically, we use nitrides. So we use boron nitride and carbon nitride. And I will move forward by explaining why do we use these materials and what do we get by using these materials. Starting with boron nitride or BN. Uh, boron nitride, as we can see, has six member rings of alternating boron and nitrogen atoms. And this can have single or double bonds between them. This material can exist in many different structures, and out of which the hexagonal and cubic structure are the most commonly used one uh, in dyes or cosmetics. However, we're mostly interested in the turbostratic or amorphous structure, as with it comes porosity, uh, hyperosophic surface area and the tunable nature of the material. So BN has actually been used as a CO2 reduction catalyst before, and it has actually reported slightly higher activity than the benchmark material in the field, which is the area. However, there face certain challenges along with this. For example, this activity is still quite low for any practical applications. And also, we need to increase even more the absorption of visible light. Because visible light actually constitutes about 50% of irradiation on the air surface. So it's 50% of the energy that we can use and harvest. We thought that one of the ways that we could combat these challenges would be dock the end with heteratoms. And we chose phosphorus for this purpose as Phosphorus doping has actually proved to be promising for this reaction in similar materials to the end. Now, we wanted to synthesize these phosph uh, phosphorus doped BN samples. We used boric acid as the boron precursor, melamine as the nitrogen precursor, and either phosphoric acid, PA, or ionic liquid, IL, for the phosphorus dopant. Now, we mix these precursors together we in water, we dry the mixture, and we react at 1050 degrees C under nitrogen atmosphere. And that is how we get two sets of samples, depending on which phosphorus dopant we use. We have PBN PA samples using phosphoric acid, which are lighter in color, very similar to the actual pristine boron nitride. And we also have PBN IL by using ionic liquid way darker, potentially due to carbon contaminations here. And you will see the labeling they use HF or LF. This simply indicates higher or lower nitrogen flow during the synthesis. Now, along with all the samples, we also have a pristine BN sample to use as a reference. Initially, we want to see if we actually synthesized BN. And the way we did that is through a combination of infrared spectroscopy and X-ray diffraction. So if we look on the plot on the left-hand side, this is what we get from infrared spectroscopy, and the bands here indicate bonds that exist in the mobile. So we see that we have the typical boron nitrogen and boron oxygen bonds that we should expect in boron nitride samples. And from the XRD uh, diffraction patterns here in the middle, because of the widening of these peaks, we can say that indeed these materials are amorphous in nature, as we expected. For nitrogen sorption, if we look into the right hand side and we take a look into the type of these isotherms, we see that these materials are mostly microporous, 
So the core size is below two nanometers. And by looking at the same model here, we can see they are quite porous. They have high surface areas. Especially the PBM IL samples here have the highest surface areas among all. In order to confirm if we included phosphorus in the structure, we use X ray photoelectron spectroscopy, which is used for elemental analysis of the samples. And we see that indeed our doping was successful. We have a range of different phosphorus dopings from 1 to 4 to percent in the samples. So we know that phosphorus is in there, but we don't know what is this linked to? How is phosphorus in the structure? What's the location of it? In order to um, answer to this question, we went to Diamond Lectures, which is the UK National Synchrotron Facilities, and we performed near X ray absorption uh, spectroscopy measurements. Now, what we see here is a range of photon energy, and in our measurements, we have included our four dot DNA samples along with three reference samples. Now, these reference samples include bonds between phosphorus and different elements. Phosphoric acids has PO bonds, the boron phosphorine complex has PB and PC bonds, and the phosphazine has PN bonds. Now, if we take a look into the plot in the middle here, we can see, first of all, that all of our samples share the same peak at the same energy. And also, this peak is shared by one of the reference samples, which is the phosphorus sample. And from this, we can suggest that all of our dot samples actually have a similar chemical environment around the phosphorus atoms. And we have the creation of PN bonds, very similar to phosphorus in sample. Now, these bonds can be either single or double bonds between phosphorus and nitrogen. This is further confirmed by XPS. And here on the right hand side, we can see the phosphorus spectra. We see that all of our materials along with the phosphorus in sample share the same peak at the same binding energy, which is very typical of the PN core. A further confirmation of this. Based on these results, we suggest that this is a possible structure that our sample share, where phosphorus can be linked to either one, two, three, or all four surrounding nitrogen atoms in the structure. I mentioned that CO2 absorption is actually one of the first steps towards CO2 photoreduction, and that's why we're interested in measuring this CO2 absorption in our materials. So we perform CO2 absorption measurements at room temperature, and as we can see from this plot on the left, we actually see a, an increase, an almost threefold increase with introducing phosphorus in the structure. So we have enhanced the CO2 absorption, especially when we're talking about PBN PA samples. If we take a look into the texture properties of the samples, we can see that it's actually the ultra micropore volume. So the volume of the pores below seven angstrom, that causes this difference and that enhance the CO2 absorption. And when we look into the heat of absorption, which is a measure of the affiliation between CO2 and our absorbents, we can see from the value on the y-axis here that we're talking about free discharge. CO2 is uh, linked with very weak bonds with our structure. And we can see that they have very, very similar heat of absorption, so very similar affinity with CO2. And this is also a confirmation that this affinity is caused by porosity about texture of our samples rather than chemistry, which is very, very different among the samples. So we needed to test these materials for photocatalytic reactions. For this purpose, we used a gas, uh, a gas phase reactor. We have a CO2 cylinder and a hydrogen generator connected here. So we have we flow CO2 and hydrogen through this reactor here. The sample is found here and is irradiated in batch. And we have a pressure rating here to measure the pressure of the gaseous products. And let's say the outcome of these gaseous products can be further injected into a gas chromatographer for analyzing the products and quantifying. 
So in the left hand side, we can see the CO generation rate. And in the right hand side, we can see the methane generation rate. Basically, our hypothesis didn't really work. Pristine BN is still a better catalyst than uh, the phosphorus dot samples, even though our samples are still visible light active. Now, why did this didn't work? Why do we see this difference between the pristine sample and the dot? If we try to explain to with the electronic properties, we may find a solution there. Uh, we use diffuser frequency spectroscopy in the UV invisible rings. And what, and what we see from this plot here is the extension of light absorption of our samples. Now, what we see is that with phosphorus doping, and especially for the PBN IL samples, we have an extended light absorption to the visible, which is from 400 to 800 nanometers which is good because we wanted to increase, to increase visible light absorption in the first place. When we look into steady state for the elimination measurements, uh, how we do this is we excite the materials at a specific wavelength. And once these materials are radiated, as we mentioned, there are excited electrons that move to the conduction path. Now, when these excited electrons go back to recombine with the holes, they can emit energy in the form of light or thermal energy. In this technique, we can measure the emission of light energy upon this recombination. So what we see here is, first of all, similar pattern among all samples. So we see the same peaks in the same range of wavelengths of energy. What does this mean? That our samples, pristine or dot samples, they, have, they share the same excited energies of these excited electrons. However, we see a difference in the, in the intensity of the peaks. What does this mean? Potentially, we have mid-gap states, some middle states between the conduction and balance band where the electrons or the holes can stay, they can be trapped there, and it can prevent recombination. And if I can visualize it a bit better here, if we have a completely non-defective material, we would have all electrons excited in the conduction band moving uh, lower to the balance band to recombine with the holes eventually, emitting energy, emitting a certain amount of energy, which is similar to the band graph energy of the material. Now, when we move to our samples, which are more defective, we see that there are these middle stages here, these mid gap states below the conduction band and above the balance band. Now we see that the charge carriers can actually be trapped there, preventing uh, possibly their combination. Another scenario would be that they still recombine at the same rate, but they emit thermal energy, which we cannot measure. So this is still an option. If we can sum up everything we know about this photoexcited species and how they behave, it will have BN and PBN on the two sides of the screen. We radiate these materials we form these excitons. The first thing that we see is that in BN we have more of these excitons than in the PBN. Now, this exciton can move in one of three ways. One way is through a reaction. They diffuse and they transfer to the catalytic surface, react with donor or, or acceptor molecules. The second is, oh, and by the way, we see that more of these electrons actually can move to the surface and react in the case of BN than of PBN. The second way would be an ultra fast recombination, almost as fast as the excitation of this species in the first place. And the third way would be still recombination of the species, but in the meantime, they get trapped in some mid gap states before further recombining. And what we see is that in PBN, the lifetimes of these species are actually a bit longer than in the BN case. So to sum up, we can use both phosphoric acid and ionic liquid as phosphorus dopants for BN. And even though these two form similar chemical bonds and environments around phosphorus atoms, we still have very different effect on the BN properties. And in general, with phosphorus doping, we can have and increased CO2 absorption, increased light extension and exit on lifetimes. However, still we have a problem with the actual reaction part 
and the seed of the contribution activity is lower than in the pristine DNA. And having summed up this project, I would like to move to our newest project, which is on carbon nitride or CN. Carbon nitride is, as we can see, pretty similar in structure with the DN. We still have six membranes. In this case, we have alternating carbon and nitrogen atoms connected through singular double bonds. Uh, they, this can exist in two structures, tri x in structure. We have heptas and rings here, so three rings connected to each other, connected to the rest of the structure, or s 3 just the ring connected to nitrogen bonds to all of the rest of the structures. The most stable of this is the tri s 3 structure. Now, carbon nitride is very widely used as a photocatalyst or for photocatalytic applications, as a support, as part of the heterojunction, or as a co-catalyst in general. Why? Because it's very stable uh, chemically and thermally, and it also has interesting, interesting optoelectronic properties. Now, if we could, could combine the properties of this material with BN's tunable nature and high adsorption capacity, and potentially have the synergy between these properties, we could create enhanced photocatalysts in the form of boron doped carbon nitride or BCN. To synthesize these catalysts, we use melamine and either boron uh, or boric acid as the precursors for the boron doping. We react uh, the powder is at 560 degrees C, hold the temperature in a muffle furnace. And that's how we again come up with two sets of samples. One set using boron or BCMP samples, one set using boric acid, BCMP samples. Again, we see a difference in color. When we introduce boron uh, by using amorphous boron as the precursor, we see a dark brown color in the samples. While when we use boric acid, we see a much more intense yellow color very similar to the original carbon nitride sample. Now, if we move to confirming the synthesis of carbon nitride samples, again, through FDIR, we see very similar, uh, the typical bonds that we can expect from carbon nitride, single and double bonds between carbon and nitrogen, some NH groups as well, as hydrogen is almost always present in the structure. And through XRD, we can confirm that, first of all, the structure doesn't really change with the amount of doping or with introducing doping. And furthermore, we have the stable structure, the tri s creating structure in our materials. Again, we use XPS of oh, uh, In order to examine the morphology of our materials, we see for the pristine carbon nitrate sample, we have different morphologies in there. We see an other cube here, which we didn't expect. Other than that, we have agglomerated amorphous clusters of particles of different sizes and shapes. When we introduce boron to the structure, we basically see again very different morphologies, but slightly smaller uh, clusters or particle sizes and further spread apart. Through XPS, we confirm the boron doping of our materials. Again, we have a range from 0.5 to 11% of boron in our materials. And here in the middle, we can see an elemental uh, composition. So we can see the total amount of carbon, nitrogen, boron, and oxygen in the structure. So when we look at this plot here, what we see is that boron and oxygen are actually analogously doped in the structure. We wanted to introduce boron, but we kind of end up uh, introducing oxygen as well, very similar numbers. And this can be confirmed if we take a look into the boron spectra of XPS. We see that all of the samples share the same peak, but in this case, we see a clear difference between the different precursors. Using boron, we do not only see the peak assigned, assigned to BO bonds, but we also see a secondary peak which can be assigned to elemental boron, suggesting that we may actually have clusters of atom, uh, of boron atoms in the structure. 
Now moving to the board uh, to the board asset samples, we have the same thing. We still have bio bonds, but for some reason in this middle sample with five hundred percent of volume, we have two different volumes. We have a bio, uh, let's say, formation, but we also have formation with a different element, which we still do not know about, and we cannot confirm simply uh, just by looking at the XPS. Now, by using EPFs, uh, we can actually see the percentages of boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen in our samples. If we take a look into this cluster right here, we actually, perhaps this is not very easy to see, but we cannot distinguish between carbon and uh, boron peaks here. Phenomenically, we have no boron in this part. Why, if we move to a larger cluster, we actually can very clearly distinguish between boron and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. What do we get from here is that, first of all, we're talking about the not homogeneous doping of boron, and also, at least in the sample size that is required for a transmission electron microscopy, we do not have analogous amounts of oxygen in boron. We do not see the same with XPS. When we're talking about the porosity of our samples, just by looking at this isotensical nitrogen absorption measurements, these samples are mostly mesoporous in this case, between 2 and 50 nanometers, with relatively low surface areas. However, there's one sample that makes a difference, and it's the one with the highest amount of doping. If we move to suit absorption measurements at room temperature, again, we see a very similar trend where only the sample with the highest amount of boron shows an enhanced CO2 absorption. Therefore, the amount of boron in this case has an effect on the properties of the material. By looking at the texture properties, we can see again that the CO2 absorption is mostly, is mostly linked to the increased microbore volume in this sample in particular. For light absorption, again, we use the fuse reflectance spectroscopy, and we actually do not see much of a difference. We see uh, between the samples, we see very similar uh, light absorption, with the, ex uh, with the exception of this sample right here, which has a very long shoulder, possibly indicating creation of more or more populated mid-gap states in this sample. By converting this diffuse reflectance spectroscopy measurements, with the Kubelka-Mond fun function, we can actually calculate the band gaps of these materials. And what we see is that with boron doping, not much of a change in the band gap. For excitons, we still, again, we use steady state photoluminescence measurements. And quite differently in this case, we do see different peaks appearing and we need with the amount of doping uh, increased. So here we have different relaxation patterns of these excited electrons, and we know that there's creation of mid cap states. And by fitting Gaussian plots, uh, by doing Gaussian fitting into this uh, spectrum here, we can tell that the mid cap states created in our materials are mostly lower than the conduction band by 0.3 eV. So this is what it should mostly look like in our materials. Of course, how populated these makeup states are can change. If we can visualize what I said previously about conduction band and valence band potential, uh, I want you to completely disregard this purple sample, which should be right about the same as the others. When we look at the top of the materials, we see the lowest point of the conduction band, and when we see the bottom, we see the highest point of the valence band. This is the potential for the activation of CO2 molecule. We see that it lies slightly higher than most of our materials. This is not what we would ideally want. Ideally, we would like this conduction band to be above the activation band. It could mean that it can affect, it can have an effect on the CO2 reduction potential. 
as far as the reaction and the conversion of, of CO2 is concerned, we can actually see that the potentials for the conversion of CO2 to different products were actually right where we wanted to be. And about water uh, reduction, again, we can perform water splitting as well with these materials. Now, we performed, uh, in this case, we changed a bit the setup to a liquid phase setup. So we still have a CO2 cylinder and we still flow CO2 through the mixture here. Here we have water with suspended uh, particles of catalyst, liquid phase, continuous steering, and we analyze the products again with gas chromatography. The liquid products, we get a sample from the liquid phase here at the end of the, at the, end of the experiment, and we do NMR. Overall, there are still very preliminary results, so I cannot really describe them yet. But what we see is that there is a higher activity for boron dot samples than pristine carbonate samples, which is what we wanted. And this can be explained by the behavior of the photoexcited species here. On the left, we have BCN sample. On the right, we have the CN sample. Radiate the samples, more excitons in the BCN than in the CN. More of the excitons react with CO2 and water, which is the sacrificial agent in this case, and potentially, and this is where we get more product formation in the BCN than in the CN. Again, we have some ultra fast recombination, and the, the excitons that actually end up in the makeup states have an increased lifetime in BCN over the CN samples. In conclusion, uh, we can still use both boric acid and boron as precursors, but we still prefer using boric acid. They actually have different, uh, they cause a different chemistry in the sample, and the BCM properties are affected by amount of uh, boron dropping in there. In general, the BC samples, in, for the BCM samples, if we have high enough concentration of boron, we have a CO2 absorption enhanced, Longer excited left extra lifetimes and better photoreducing activity than the pristine CN. So in this in this case, our hypothesis work. So at this point, I would like to thank all of uh, the members from my research group, our collaborators, and funding sources. And I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. And I welcome any questions. Yes, uh, uh, it's uh, last time you described the You're looking at the band gap, obviously. Are you measuring the dielectric properties? How they change? I have not. No. I would assume to measure dielectric properties, it also needs to be done in conductive. Or quite conductive samples as well. For the BN materials, it is the case, and we could potentially do that because they have enough conductivity to perform these measurements. But carbon nitride is very, very low as a conductive material. It, it has very low conductivity. Right. So we cannot, it's not very, very good for uh, the electric measurements. Thank you.